That's Nick. And that's Joseph, and today we're here to talk about Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, the 1988 classic which Arrow Video uh, put out on Blu-ray uh, April 28th, 2020, which we just received, I'm assuming due to COVID-19 delays. That's okay, it's never too late for uh, <laughs> Elvira. Uh, although I did read uh, the, the title will also be streaming on Arrow's channel uh, in July, so I guess it's kind of timely. Yeah. Uh, so Elvira, I became familiar with her in the early 80s because she had that TV show, like mm -hmm. a local LA show, mm -hmm. something about the macabre, mm -hmm. where she would like, kind of mystery science theater. Yeah, and, and she's... A, or they copied her, I guess, but whatever. <laughs> well, and also a riff on um, the Ed Wood actress uh, as well, that I forget, God, I forget her name, uh, that kind of had, had the same vibe that Elvira borrowed. Yeah. Um, so obviously, like, as a kid, I found her very uh, interesting because her look is pretty extreme. Mm -hmm. uh, and my sister and I would watch uh, this film regularly as kids. I don't know how appropriate it is now looking Probably at not. it. I don't, I don't believe I was allowed to watch her, but my parents were also afraid of the occult. And New Age, I remember in the 90s, was a term uh, that was uh, tossed around a bit, uh, like Yanni and Elvira. Yanni and Elvira. <laughs> they go together like <laughs> Anything, peanut butter and pork I'm, loin. <laughs> they, would, they wouldn't let me watch the Ghostbusters cartoon for a minute. Oh. Like, so I had to sneak watch things. So this DVD uh, release features... Uh, is the film restor uh, like a restoration? Do we know? Did we check? I didn't check. Oh. But it, lo but it looks good. It does look good. <laughs> but it also features a behind-the-scenes like documentary mm -hmm. that's about 90 minutes. Uh... Anyway, the actual story of the film, do you want to try to tell it or do you want me to do it? We, you're so good at synopsizing. We find Elvira working for a local TV station, not unlike uh, how we all discovered her. Um, where, and the station has been taken over by some Texan millionaire who's a total creep. Mm -hmm. He wants to have sex with her. She says no, so she's fired. But she doesn't care because she thinks she has a gig booked in Vegas, mm -hmm. like to headline a show. But her agent tells her, no, they aren't going to do it unless you front 50000 of your own money. She doesn't have that money. But just as she's figuring that out, she gets a letter, a telegram, <laughs> saying that her um, long-lost great-aunt has died and left her something in the will. So she has to travel to Massachusetts to attend the reading of the will. So she makes her little trek. Uh, when she gets there, she finds out she has inherited her aunt's home, her aunt's dog, and her aunt's cookbook, mm -hmm. recipe book. So of course she's disappointed. She needs cash. Mm -hmm. So she is attempting to figure out how to make the cash, which involves selling the house. However, enter her evil uncle, mm -hmm. Because there's a supernatural component. The recipe book is actually like a book of spells. And her uncle is like a warlock. Uncle Vinny. Who wants this book so he can like rule the world or whatever. Um, he's not successful in getting it. Um, she ultimately prevails. Mm -hmm. Her uncle dies. So as his sole heir, she gets all of the money. And now she's able to do her show in Vegas. The end. All right. And finds love in there. She and finds love mixed up in there, friendship. She uh, yeah, with all the, the town's teenagers who... There's like a Tu Wong Fu element to it. There is a Tu Wong, yeah, because she has, she has the car, the T-bird that the, break, the break, breaks down. The car breaks down. She's forced to stay there longer than she'd care to. In the end, the town recognizes that she has brought a positive change. She's reinvigorated them. She's reinvigorated. She's also, you know, Elvira's very drag queen adjacent as a character, a persona herself. And she's a gay icon. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um... What do you think about the film? Uh, you know, it's grown on me. I don't think I... I think that you made me watch this when we started dating. Probably. And that was the first time I'd seen it. I'm, you know, familiar with Elvira, of course, but I'd never seen the film. Uh, and it's grown on me because you trot it out every now and then. So I'm happy to see that it has a, a deserved Blu-ray release. Um, yeah, it's fun. You just kind of have to settle into that. It's just kind of be... It, and even in the extra feature they talk about, if this were made today, it would be much more racy. Because this PG-13, because she's such a vamp. She's so, um, you know, she's te visually she's oozing with sexual sexuality, but, you know, as pl played by Cassandra Peterson, she's kind of just a big dork. Which is her charm, right? right I mean, right. she's kind of goofy. Her, 
her comedy is filled with innuendo. Oh, sure. But it's also there's know. an innocence to that. Though. I don't know that I needed the 1988 film to be raunchy. No, no. Because I think it fits her character. I think it's. I think just our expectations watching it. Right, right. Because she is a sex pot. Yeah, you would assume that they would have done so much more. Um, it was directed by James Signorelli, uh, who's a... Uh, since then has uh, produced uh, years worth of SNL and directed SNL related things for you. But this was his last film. Uh, oh. And previous to this, he directed Easy Money, a, a Rodney Dangerfield comedy. Oh. Um, I think if you're a fan of Elvira, you've probably seen this. So picking up this release would just be for the, um, the new behind the scenes feature. If you mm -hmm. haven't seen it, you know, it's not a good film. Like, it's not terrible either. But though. it's not terrible. No. The production uh, quality is high. Elvira is magnetic. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it, almost, it doesn't really even matter that nothing makes sense. Um, no. Peterson in, the, in the, out, the feature was talking about how it was criticized for not having characterization. Character like, well, do, do you expect that from this film? Like, what are your expectations watching this film? Obviously not it. No, no. I think uh, just watching her for 90 minutes is sufficient. Um, so I... She had wanted Tim Burton to be the director originally, and it feels very Tim Burton esque. Um, I could see it going that way. It, it kind of settles in the middle because it also feels very John Waters. The orgy scene uh, when they ingest the the love potion in her stew or whatever. Yeah, that it it made me think like, oh, if John Waters had done a movie with Elvira, you know, the world would be just a little more complete. Well, I can go through my list. Um, first, there's a character named Chastity Pariah. <laughs> Played by Edie McClure. Which makes me laugh every time. And that actor is so good in this role. Um, and she plays she's she plays that role often, right? Well, she's the, I think she's the secretary in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like a like a uptight, conservative. Yes. Prude. Yeah, prude. Mm -hmm. um, a neuter. Yeah. Um, so some fun scenes. I think the most famous scene is the picnic orgy. Mm -hmm. So Elvira, um, the first time she attempts to use the cookbook, it's because she... So the town hunk, mm -hmm. who in the behind um, the scenes, uh, Elvira explains that he was meant to be like a dumb blonde, mm -hmm. like the male equivalent of a dumb blonde. That character's name is Bob. He's just a hunky, sweet, like dog type man. Mm -hmm. uh, she uh, is dog. attracted to... Well, he's like a big lovable dog. Yeah. That's what I meant to say. Um, she wants him. He's kind of oblivious to it. She invites him to his house. And what I think is a really funny scene because they there's a midnight screening. Mm -hmm. She's trying to make money and Bob owns a theater. So she's like, I got you. I'm going to do a midnight screening. And All the kids are going to come. And she shows, I think, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Right. Yeah. So the screening's at midnight. They show the film. She does a performance afterwards. So we can assume it ends at 2 a.m. They make their way back to her house with a couple of the kids. Well, she's also dumped in... Is it gasoline? She's tarred and feathered. She's tarred and feathered, so she has to clean off That's all right. of That's right. She's tarred and feathered. So they get back to her house well after 2 a.m., we would presume. Then she takes a gasoline bath to get all of the tar off of her. Uh, you know, obviously redoes her hair and makeup. Then, so it's probably, what, 4 in the morning? She's... They're downstairs with two other kids. She tells them to take a hike because she wants time alone with Bob. Mm -hmm. He's nervous, so he says, well, I'm hungry. She's like, I'll whip you up something to eat. <laughs> so who knows what time it is. Um, she makes him something out of his uh, her recipe book, which is like your stereotypical witch's spell, mm -hmm. like worms and gross things. And um, a pretty cool um, practical effect occurs, mm -hmm. which is like this monster comes out of the pot. Mm -hmm. That's a scene I recall very distinctly as yeah. a kid. Yeah, and it, it looks, it still looks really good. It looks yeah. really good. But I think that scene's so funny because it's like, it's probably 6 a.m. Yeah. By the time this is happening, <laughs> uh, they've been up all night. Uh, another funny scene is, uh, or what I remember from a kid is when she talks about the food, she says it looks like cock doo Mm -hmm. And my sister and I would laugh about that. Oh, and the, the tic-tac pie. <laughs> the tic-tac pie at the picnic. Making fun of the Oh, but getting shit. back to the most famous scene, which is the picnic orgy. So she decides that she's going to get everyone back uh, from mistreating her. Mm -hmm. So she wants to make the same dish, mm -hmm. presents it at the potluck picnic. So when someone opens the lid, this monster pops out and attacks everyone. But she doesn't reproduce the recipe exactly how she did the first time. So... She makes some substitutions. So really, the stew she makes is like a... 
it makes everyone horny. Mm-hmm. So then all these townspeople are engaging in an orgy. So the next day, the city council gets together and decides that she's a witch, mm-hmm. and they're going to burn her at the stake. Because an old law back dating back from the Salem witch days uh, allows them to do so. Yeah. So they burn her at the stake, but she... Um, we understand that her mom had, like, magical powers, mm-hmm. and Elvira's backstory is that her mom was being sought after by her uncle, she wasn't safe, so she gave up Elvira for, like, adoption, mm-hmm. and provided her with this ring that she's worn ever since. An amulet. That should protect her. Mm-hmm. So in her final moment, the 11th hour, when she's being burned at the stake, it's the ring that saves her by producing rain to put out the fire. By then, her evil uncle has stolen the cookbook, so now he's like a powerful warlock. But Elvira's able to defeat him very easily with the ring. <laughs> the end. Um, I think... Uh, uh, what was I going to say? What were you going to say? I just went blank. Things you like? Well, just Elvira. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I was going to talk about the behind the scenes, but the last thing I wrote down was, in the end, we get a glimpse of Elvira's Vegas show. And she does, like, oh, a yes. musical number. And you had commented that there's a scene where she's twirling with her breasts. Oh, yeah, tassels, yeah. Which reminded us of Ben De La Creme and his All-Stars performance. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. There, there are other, like, RuPaul, RuPaul's line about how's your head. I haven't from, had any complaints. Is that from this film? It might be. You know, most of RuPaul's dialogue is borrowed or stolen. That's so. yes. That, I mean, I most likely yes. And Elvira's been on Drag Race, right? So, so we know he's a fan. We know he's a fan. Anyway, uh, so the behind the scenes. Uh, what did we learn from that? Well, it's pretty. It's comprehensive. Sorry, but it's it's a little dry. What did we learn? What did we learn? It is a little dry. It's a little. It focuses a little too much on some of the like, supporting. They bring back some of these teenagers, and some of them are a little. Like the, worse for wear. Well, they, well, don't have a lot to really talk about. Um, so you know, I would imagine filming something like that. You get all the information you can, and then it's somebody's job to edit out all the stuff that's dull. Which it's like they kept everything in. That's I presume they didn't have enough to fill up ninety minutes. So well, that's why we're hearing from all these like C players. Well, because it's really not a wondrous film. It's it's a it's a fun time capsule of a, a significant person. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's really about it. Like, maybe if Tim Burton had gotten a hold of it or a, a John Waters, it could have been this campy cult thing. But it's just kind of this funny, silly little thing. What did I learn? Um, all of the men on set seem to be creeps because all they can talk about is how nice it was to see to her, her, to touch her, to catch her, to get a glimpse of her breasts. Well, except for the one that might... The, the one that was tough... Because Brad Pitt was almost cast in the film and the one who won the role over Brad Pitt. He seems a little fruity. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so who knows? Maybe he just really liked her makeup. But anyway, um, we also learned that Elvira seems very sensitive to, like, you know, because this was her vehicle, but she she tells several stories about how she didn't know when the tars dropped on her it was paint. She didn't know how hard and it was going to be and how uncomfortable. When the gas station is, there's a scene where a gas station is, um, like, blows up. Mm-hmm. She didn't know how that was going to be. She seems to, uh, the, the, the scene where she's burned at the stake, she didn't realize how bad that was going to be. Are you calling Cassandra Peterson fragile? I, I think the actor seems a little, like, delicate Partic- partic- in particular. Well, you know, like, Liz Taylor hurt herself on every movie set, basically. Yeah, she seems, also, like, the way she plays with her hair, she seems very particular about how she wants to look. Oh, well, I'm sure, yeah. And even in the behind the scenes, like, she is lit for the gods. Mm-hmm. So, you know, but that's her brand. I mean, she's yeah. all about, she looks fantastic. Um, well, part of her lore too is the, the you know Elvira was created out of to hide kind of the burn marks that she she sustained has, as a child. Yeah, so it's more her costuming. Yeah, it's a co- it's a comfort level. This persona. No, the, watching her speak about the film is fascinating. Yeah, and sure. watching like her friend, who's the other writer, mm-hmm. him telling stories was also fun. But yeah, I, I would say forty five minutes of that behind the scenes is kind of just like stuff they could have cut out. My final point was, after watching the behind the scenes, I would love for there to be a documentary about her where she explains, because I'm sure she was very poorly treated in Hollywood. Oh, yeah, yeah. She, she was treated as a joke. I, you know, the other thing, the document, because I think we forget um, now the the line of demarcation between television stars and film stars. That, Which that they mentioned in the behind the scenes. That was a thing. They also talk about how she 
NBC produced the film mm -hmm. and they gave her a deal where they would do like however many pictures they can squeeze out of her and then once that's done they would do a television show and I would love to hear I would love for the doc there to be a documentary that explains why Elvira never like was bigger mm -hmm. because she is like the perfect uh, person to be a big star but I, I don't think like middle America was ready like she was very peripheral cult status she and was but I would love to hear like queer figures like significant queer figures talk about and like executives talk about why someone like her didn't make it to the mainstream because she's perfect I she's think beautiful it, she's funny I agree. her humor is very you know the innuendos it's heavy but I think it's still appropriate enough that it could be I think it's time. I think it's timing I think yeah I just feel bad because I, I like I wish that there would have been no Lyra TV show the same I mean those were the Reagan years it was shit time but she still looks great like now and you know she's the same age as RuPaul so I think Elvira could have a renaissance like yeah I, I agree. she has an autobiography she, coming out in a few months she's featured in a lot of like she's in the all about evil yeah uh, but, out, of, out of Elvira drag but anyway what would you give this film I'll, I'll, anybody else want to shout out nobody who Susan Kellerman? Who's that? Patty. Oh. I think she, I love watching her in that character. Patty, that character's great, and the the actor is in the behind the scenes talk. Oh, so like something I didn't know is that I, I always assumed that the actor playing Patty didn't have large breasts. In fact, she does have large breasts. So in the scene where she's exposed as wearing falsies, they had to hire a stunt double mm -hmm. to be flat chested. <laughs> And then for the rest, the remainder of the film, uh, Patty, the actor, is bound mm -hmm. with bandages to look flat chested. Um, she, I always think of her. Um, and she also looks great now. She does. Yeah. But I always think of her when I see her because she's in Death Becomes Her. She is the, when Meryl Streep is carted off to the morgue and Bruce Willis goes back, he's like, where's my wife? She's the doctor that's like trying to tell him like. It's okay. That's her. Her. That's her. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, she's great. Mm -hmm. I do think several of the people in the behind the scenes, like including her, you know, they agreed to do it, but they seem very much like maybe it's kind of beneath them or very far away from them. Sure. Because yeah. the one guy, uh, the the one who's the real estate agent, Fuller, Kirk Fuller. he spends most of the time complaining about. Mm -hmm. How he didn't realize this was show business was like, and all the conditions weren't great. He seems half like disgruntled. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting to watch, but it does seem like the behind the scenes was like scraped together. But if you're a fan, pick it up. Yeah. What would you give this film? Uh, three out of five. I would give it three out of five. Anything else? No, that's it. All right. Bye. Bye.